So the last part of cellular respiration in bacteria um, can include an, uh, or does include an electron transport chain. All right. The whole point of the electron transport chain is to oxidize that NADH that was generated in glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. Okay, because remember I said that NADH essentially is carrying those electrons, okay? And what that NADH is going to do, because it's hanging out there in the cytoplasm of the bacteria, it's going to deposit that electron into the electron transport chain within the plasma membrane of the bacteria, okay? So these blue boxes that I have here, These are cytochromes, all right? Each of the five that I've drawn here have different names. And to be honest, I'm not all that concerned that you know the names of the different cytochromes, okay? But what I do want you to understand is it's those cytochromes now that are going to become important in the process of generating ATP. Because in order to generate ATP in the electron transport chain, we need to generate a hydrogen gradient. And the way that's going to happen, that NADH is going to come in and it's going to deposit that electron into the first cytochrome as part of our electron transport chain. That electron then is going to kind of bounce around in the membrane and it's going to go, all right, that electron is going to go from a high energy to a low energy electron, all right, as it passes through those various cytochromes. And what that does is that energy, essentially, that's released from the electron bouncing around in the cell membrane, that's going to allow hydrogen from the cytoplasmic side of that plasma membrane to move into the space between the membrane and the cell wall. What that's going to do, you're going to take a large amount of hydrogen there, and what you're going to generate there is our hydrogen gradient. Oops, that's an A, not a D. I got ahead of myself. All right, so essentially you have more hydrogen here, less hydrogen cytoplasmically, okay? And what that does then <coughs> is that creates our um, hydrogen gradient. And what happens, the last component in our electron transport chain, and this molecule I want you to know the name of, okay? This is our ATPase, okay? So it's ASE, this is an enzyme, all right? And what it does is it allows those hydrogens now to diffuse from an area of high concentration to low concentration, okay? And that hydrogen going along its concentration gradient now creates the ability for ADP and a free phosphate to be converted into an ATP molecule, okay? So generating that hydrogen gradient is really important for allowing those hydrogens now to shoot back across the cell membrane into the cytoplasmic space. The energy of that hydrogen going from high to low concentration creates the chemical bond here between ADP and the free phosphate to generate our energy, to generate our ATP, okay? 
Now I kind of stopped here with the electron bouncing around in the um, cytochromes because there is another component to this, okay? The electron does need to leave the electron transport chain, all right? And I've kind of put a lot of writing here, so I'm going to clear some things away here, all right? What's going to happen when that electron leaves the electron transport chain? If we're talking about aerobic respiration, our final electron acceptor is going to be oxygen, okay? So if the bacteria undergoes aerobic respiration, that means it uses oxygen, all right? And that electron takes the hydrogen and the oxygen within the cytoplasmic space, and it generates as a byproduct water, okay? In terms of that terminal electron acceptor, you can have different molecules that act as a terminal electron acceptor. And that's what happens with bacteria that undergo anaerobic respiration. All those steps we covered before with glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, cycle, Krebs cycle happen, those electrons are going to move through the electron transport chain. The only difference between aerobic respiration that I'm concerned about you knowing and anaerobic respiration is the final electron acceptor, okay? Anaerobic, there are some other molecules that can serve as that electron acceptor. Um, you can have sulfate. You can have a carbonate. You can have a nitrate. Those are the most common. I think there are some others, but most commonly in anaerobic respiration, those are your final electron acceptors. Okay? The key difference, there's a lot more variability in the total number of ATP that can be generated. Okay? Typically, anaerobic respiration is a little less um, efficient. Okay? We don't get quite as many ATP out. It can range anywhere from two, which is really inefficient, to in the range of, you know, the high 20s. We'll put it at 28, maybe into 30. Aerobic t respiration, typically you're going to generate 30 or so ATP. You could go high 20s also. There's some variation depending on the microbe you're talking about um, and some other considerations that I don't want you to worry about. What I do want you to understand is this part of the diagram here, okay? We're talking about this is the bacterial cell wall, bacterial plasma membrane, those cytochromes, the electron's going to bounce around in those cytochromes, eventually leaves as a low energy electron. If we're talking aerobic respiration, that electron can, um, takes hydrogen and oxygen and creates water as the waste product, okay? That hydrogen gradient, because the high energy electron goes from high to low, allows hydrogen to gather in the space in between the cell wall and the plasma membrane. Those hydrogens then cross back across through a, um, the ATPase. And in terms of that, that's what generates your ATP, okay? Those are the parts of the electron transport chain I really want you to concentrate and understand. Also understand the difference between what happens aerobically and anaerobically. It comes down to the final electron acceptor, all right? If you have any questions, let me know.